Okay, this is going to be our second week of doubling up on laboratory exercises. We're going to do exercise 8, that's the genetics laboratory in your lab manual, as well as exercise 9, which is going to be DNA analysis. And um, uh, for the life of me, I look at exercise 8 and I can't really think that there's anything for me to talk about. It's just a matter of making observations on ourselves and determining phenotypes and genotypes and then graphing the results. It's a pretty straightforward laboratory. I don't think anybody's going to be stretched too much by that. I think I think if there's one more challenging part, and it's worthwhile for us to go over a little bit, it would be that last part on pedigree analysis. And it's it's really some basic and straightforward logic. And it is a little bit uh, it's a little bit opaque for some people. Uh, so I thought I'd just kind of walk th you through the uh, logic, the general logic on how we can infer genotypes based on pedigree analysis. And basically the idea here is that uh, is that in a typical situation with Mendelian inheritance, we'll have one trait that is dominant and the other one that's recessive. And so if I draw out the genotypes as you know them, we will use A's, I could have a homozygous dominant, I could have a heterozygote, and I could have a homozygote for the recessive allele. And you know that both of these two are going to be sharing the dominant trait. Well, the phenotype of the little a homozygote is going to have a recessive trait. And sometimes we use a shorthand for those individuals that have the dominant trait. I mean, if you have an individual that's got the dominant phenotype, you don't know whether it's big A, big A, or big A, little, whether it's homozygous or heterozygous. So if you don't know whether it's, whether it's this or this, you could say that we have big A dash. And, uh, and uh, you'll figure that part out based on the first part of exercise 8. Now, uh, with pedigree analysis, you have an opportunity to uh, infer what genotypes are based on the family histories. And with a pedigree, it's basically a family tree. Uh, we're going to be representing parents. A male parent is going to be a square. A female parent is going to be a circle. And when square and circle love each other very much, they start to produce lots and lots of babies. So let's kind of draw four babies here. Okay. And so maybe they have a daughter first, then they have another daughter, and then they have a son, and then they have another daughter. Okay, and, and so this is kind of like a family of four, I'm sorry, a family of six, right? Uh, in which mom and dad have three daughters and one son. Okay. Now we can mark which individuals in this tree have the two different traits. And maybe, uh, maybe the father has uh, a, a trait, a particular trait, and maybe we're seeing this in a couple of the offspring. So that daughter and the son have the same trait that the dad has, but the uh, oldest daughter and the youngest daughter have the same trait as the mom. Okay? And, and so it works like this. If I, if I tell you that um, the dark color, the dark color is going to represent the dominant trait, then I could ask you, uh, what do we know about the genotypes of all six individuals that we have in this tree? It's a fair question. Uh, and, and you'd be able to answer that. I think, uh, I think the basic approach here would be to say, well, if you have uh, the recessive trait, right, uh, we must be little a, little a. Okay? And so we could basically go ahead and fill these guys in. Little a, little a, little a, little a, little a, little a. And that's supposed to be a little a there. Right? And, and so uh, that part is easy. You could say, well, the dominant trait, we, we know that the dominant trait is going to be a big A dash. But in this particular case, we can go ahead and identify for certain which of the two uh, genotypes they might be. Okay, so uh, we, we know for a fact that uh, this parent here, this father, had two daughters that were little a, little a. And so they must have inherited a little a from him. And therefore, we know that this father cannot be big A, big A. Right? Uh, this, you know, this possibility here is out the window because we know that he had two daughters uh, that are homozygous uh, for the recessive allele. So they must have gotten that recessive allele from dad, and therefore dad must be big A, little a. Right? That's for certain. The other thing is that we know that these two offspring down here, right? they must be big A, little a as well. Why? Well, it's, it's, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, one of their parents is this female who's a little a, little a. She's, she had to have passed on a little a gene to both of these 
children, and so and so we know that they're not little a little a, so they must be big a little a, because they must have gotten the big a gene from dad and a little a gene from mom. Okay. And that's kind of like the sense of how we use pedigree analyses to uh, infer what the genotypes are. Okay. The other kind of situation that you might be needing to be aware of is, uh, is for example, if we had two individuals, two parents that are both of the same trait, they both have the same trait, and they have offspring that bear the other trait. At this point, I don't even need to tell you uh, whether uh, the white color is dominant or the white color is recessive. Uh, all you need to do is to look at this, and you'll realize that the only way these two parents uh, could have uh, an offspring with the other phenotype would be for these guys to be heterozygotes. And I'm going to use B here to represent the, uh, the, the alleles, because we're not really talking about the same gene that we had up in the top graph. Okay, remember that, that uh, the only way that we could have two individuals bearing an offspring with the opposite phenotype would be for them to be heterozygous. And so this guy right here must be a homozygote for the recessive gene. Okay. Uh, these two over here, okay, we don't know what they are, right? Because they could be big B, big B or they could be big B, little B. We wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So in this case, you would say, but both of these must be big B dash. Big B dash. There's no information that would allow us to distinguish between uh, the two possibilities for their genotypes. Okay. And so all of our pedigree analyses at the end of exercise eight are going to be based on this type of logic. And uh, you can actually go ahead and do those ahead of time if you like. We're going to be spending a little bit of time in the laboratory making sure that you know how to do them. All right, now let's go on to uh, some basic information relating to exercise nine. Okay, so here what, I wanted, what I'm going to do is to draw a molecule of DNA for you because I want to depict uh, two important features of DNA. Uh, first of all, we know that they're based on nucleotides, and uh, you might know that a nucleotide is going to be formed from a sugar. The sugar actually has five carbons. This is a carbon there, carbon, 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 and carbon. And we number these carbons, uh, one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, we keep track of the carbons. We know that the nitrogenous base is coming off of carbon number one. Maybe it's an adenine here. And we know that off the carbon number five, we've got a phosphate group. Okay. And so a nucleotide is the building block for a polynucleotide, which we sometimes refer to as a nucleic acid. And the way that nucleic acids are built from mononucleotides is always going to be following a similar pattern. Uh, we're going to be taking the number three carbon, this carbon right here, this one right here. And we're going to be forming a bond with a phosphate group, which is attached to the number five carbon, five carbon attached, which is part of the next sugar down. Okay. So here's the next ribose sugar, or deoxyribose sugar. Here's carbon number one, two, three, four, and five. And so the, we always have a three to five, a three to five bond. Uh, the phosphate group is going to connect the number three carbon of one sugar with the number five carbon of the next sugar. It's going to connect with the uh, phosphate, this number three sugar to the number five sugar of the next molecule over. This is number five carbon over here. This is going to be our third nucleotide in the sequence. All right, we'll add one more. Okay, so here's our last number three carbon. The number three carbon at this end is just going to have an OH. OH attached to it. And remember that off the number one carbons, we're, be, we're putting the bases. This might be a C, this one might be a T, and this one might be another C, right? So I guess the, uh, the, the uh, one important lesson here is that there's a directionality to DNA. We always read DNA uh, in, or let me put it this way. When we read DNA, we, we need to take special notice as to which strand we're reading and the direction in which we're reading it. So we always identify one end of the molecule, this end over here. We call this the five prime end. It's the one that actually has an exposed number five carbon attached to a phosphate group. Okay. On the other end of the molecule, we have an exposed three prime carbon, and we call this the three prime end of the molecule. And so this is the directionality of one of the two strands of DNA. 
Now, if we look at the other strand of DNA, uh, it is going to be complementarily base paired with the first one. So you know that A is going to have a couple of hydrogen bonds attaching it to the T of the opposite strand. And the C's are going to be uh, associated with guanines, and the T is going to be associated with adenines. And so we have this situation where we've got the opposite strands. We've got the opposite strands uh, with complementary base pairs. So, so these guys are also going to be attached to a sugar phosphate chain. Um, they're going to be attached to the number one carbons. Okay, so here's the number one carbon. Uh, and, uh, and, and these carbons are going to be hooked together uh, via the three to five prime end. So, so this is going to be the number five carbon over here. Number five carbon is going to be attached to a phosphate group. And we'll have an OH at the three prime end. And on the other side, on the right hand side over here, we're going to have the five prime end of the other strand. Okay. So the two lessons here. Uh, one, we've got this directionality of, of DNA, of, of any nucleic acid. There's going to be a five prime end and a three prime end on every molecule. And the other part is that the complementary base paired strands are going to be running anti-parallel, which basically means that they run in opposite directions. If strand A, we call this one Watson, is going to a run uh, left to right, uh, five prime to three prime like this. The other strand we can call him Crick. He's going to run five prime to three prime in the other direction. This is a really, really, really basic bit of information that's central to um, most people's understanding of DNA. Okay, now uh, what I want to do is to kind of expand this out because basically what I've drawn here is a, a very, very short polynucleotide. I might have, I would draw this like this, A, C, T, C. On one strand, this is going to be written 5 prime to 3 prime. And on the other side, I would have G, A, G, T, running 5 prime to 3 prime on the other strand. Okay. So yeah, this is the basic layout of how we typically depict a double-stranded molecule of DNA. Now the reality is that uh, when we actually look at DNA information, when we look at sequences, we don't need to show both strands. Uh, one strand is enough. If, we ha if you have uh, the strand that is going 5 prime to 3 prime, you don't really need to see the other strand. Uh, I'll be showing you the other strand anyways for now because we want to keep in mind that it, it is a double-stranded molecule. I've got a nice long molecule here for you to look at. Okay, And so what we're looking at here is a double-stranded molecule of DNA. You can notice that all the T's and A's are paired, all the G's and C's are paired. So, so maybe this is a molecule that's running 5 prime to 3 prime on the purple strand. It's going to be running 5 prime to 3 prime on the brown strand in the opposite direction. So, so this is kind of like the molecule that I drew before. Okay, now a, a couple of, of G whiz, wow, but this is really important things, is that even though this, this sequence of base looks kind of long, at least compared to the four base sequence that I showed you before, uh, this is nothing compared to the overall sequence of a typical genome. Okay, uh, I'll give you an example. Your genome, the human genome, consists of roughly three billion bases. It's three followed by nine zeros more or less. Okay, so in other words, this DNA double-stranded molecule, uh, it, of course it's broken into chromosomes, but if you put all that DNA end-to-end, -end, it would be about two meters. Uh, for those of you who don't convert yet, that's over six and a half feet. Okay, so a human genome is going to be a molecule like this going forever, pretty much. Three billion bases is an awful lot of DNA. It's not the biggest genome, um, uh, it's, it's a pretty big genome, but it's not the biggest genome. There are a lot of genomes that are bigger. Some genomes are smaller. For example, uh, the fruit fly, uh, your, your typical fruit fly that we use in genetic studies, has a genome of about 122 million bases. E. coli, the bacteria where we first cut our teeth in genetic studies, has a genome that's much smaller. It's about 5 million. But even a simple bacterium is going to have 5 million bases and several thousand genes. Uh, this is not uh, at all surprising. We've always kind of known that it takes a lot of information to uh, create a living cell. It's a, it's a living cell is a very complex thing, and it's not something that is going to have very few moving parts. 
In our lab exercise, we're going to be opening up a strawberry cell and looking at the genome of strawberries. And strawberries are, are, are pretty well endowed when it comes to DNA. Uh, it's, they've got about 720 to 750 million bases in their genome. They, they're really rich in DNA, which is why they make a really nice demonstration when it comes to collecting DNA. They've got plenty of DNA in the chromosomes to collect. Okay. So yeah, the, the, this is a really, really large genome. And uh, when you think about the task of DNA editing or DNA engineering, we're, we're, we're going to uh, come along and uh, change the code or insert new pieces of code. Uh, this is not going to be a necessarily an easy task. We, we've got a lot of information to sort through. We'd like to put changes in particular locations and not in others. I mean, there's just, if you're going to be creating a new monster with your GMO project, now that you're working for Monsanto, uh, you'll need to put your genes into specific locations. And for the longest time, we were totally limited in our ability to make cuts in the DNA. I mean, we had some tools, but they were very, very, they were very, very snotty. These tools, once the gold standard of DNA manipulation, uh, were the restriction endonucleases, which are taken from bacteria. Sometimes we call them restriction enzymes, which were really pretty cool at the time, uh, because what they would do is they would uh, uh, they would make double-stranded cuts at very, very specific sequences. Uh, the example that you'll be playing with, you'll be running through in your lab book, is restriction in nuclease, maybe the most commonly used one, called ECO-R1, which basically stands for E. coli. It's the uh, bacterial endonuclease that we got from E. coli that has a, a, a very specific restriction site that's almost kind of famous. Uh, it's G A a T T C and that's red five prime to three prime. Anytime that you find G A A T T C, it's going to be making a double stranded cut. It, uh, the, the cut goes between the G and the A. And and what happens here is is that the other strand, draw it in a different color, the other strand is going to be cut also because its sequence is also G A A T T C being read five prime to three prime. See that it's it's yeah you know, it's kind of like it's a palindrome, okay? Uh, if eco R1 is only looking for G A A T T C, read from the uh, five prime to three prime end, it's actually seeing that on both of these strands. It's making a cut there. It's making a cut there, and the two sides of the DNA are going to be able to go in their separate ways. And so, uh, and, and so, yeah, I mean, if you look at this strand, uh, if, if you're an eco R1 molecule, this is, this is you, this is your eco R1, you're going to be looking for a specific thing. You'll be, you'll be looking uh, down this molecule, down this molecule, and, and hey, hey, right here, right here, we've got G, A, A, T, T, C, and so we're going to be coming in and we're making a cut there. We're making a cut there. And, and basically, this fragment on the top is going to go and separate off from the fragment down below. Well, the double-stranded molecule down into the right, the double-stranded molecule down up into the left, and we'll have this little uh, this little overlap, this overlay where we've got T T A A on one strand, A A T T on the other strand, and uh, and they're not going to be uh, they're not going to be paired with anything. Okay, and so these restriction endonucleases were great in the sense that they allowed us to cut DNA at specific sites. The problem uh, was that we only had a few dozen of these restriction endonucleases, and so the, uh, the specific locations at which we could actually make the cuts were very, very limited. I mean, it's not like we could go in and cut any place we wanted. Uh, we had to cut where the restriction endonucleases were allowing us to cut. Okay. Now fast forward to 2014. Uh, Jennifer Doudna um, and Emmanuel Charpentier uh, are uh, are working on this really cool uh, restriction endonuclease called Cas9. Uh, Cas9 is an endonuclease that's taken from Streptococcus. It's basically the the, uh, the bacterium that causes you to get strep throat. And what they found is that you can attach Cas9 is is a really good restriction enzyme because with a little bit of ingenuity, uh, Doudna and Charpentier were able to uh, customize Cas9 using a very specific RNA sequence, and that's what the CRISPR is. So if you've heard of CRISPR, 
the, the real the real unit, the real tool that we have coming out of this technology is this CRISPR Cas9 sequence. Cas9 are the scissors. They're the ones that make the double stranded cut. The CRISPR is a customized RNA code, which is going to be allowing the scissors to look over the entire DNA and recognize those stretches of DNA that are complementary to the RNA piece that we put in. In other words, what Doubt and Charpentier have, get, have given us is a technology that allows us to pretty much go into the genome anywhere in your 3 billion bases. If you, if you wanted to cut like right here, you could basically create a, an RNA template, the, not the, uh, the RNA sat-nav or GPS as it's called in the, in the uh, podcast that I had you listen to. Uh, you, can, you can make an RNA molecule that's going to recognize this site and attach it to Cas9, and the Cas9 will come in and make a snip right there. Okay, And, and, uh, and uh, using a tool like this, the opportunities for us to make genetic modifications has opened up substantially. With this one discovery, we can now do things that were just unimaginable just a few years ago. Okay, So what next? Oh yeah, the strawberries. Let's talk about strawberries. Okay, so what you're going to do is you'll take a strawberry, you're going to be putting it into a bag, a little Ziploc bag, uh, with a uh, with some extraction buffer. So we put some buffer in here. Uh, the, uh, the amount of buffer is specified in your lab manual, and then you're going to mush this whole thing up. Uh, you're going to be turning this into strawberry smoothie, uh, basically. Okay, you get the idea. And uh, we're going to be straining this. We'll be running this, this smoothie through uh, some cheesecloth to get us uh, to get basically some extract, some cellular extract, and it's going to be going into a tube. I'll draw this like a little beaker, but it's going to be you're going to be doing this in a tube. So you'll have your strawberry smoothie extract, which is going to contain the DNA. It'll be uh, kind of pinkish, and at this point, the DNA, the DNA is going to be totally in solution. DNA. You can't see it because it's going to be it's going to be impossibly thin. It'll be in there. And what we're going to be doing is we'll be taking advantage of the fact that DNA is not very soluble in alcohol in uh, in a substance that's got a much lower polarity rel relative to water. So we're going to be uh, layering, kind of like a this is kind of like a, where the bartenders in class are going to have a, a strong advantage. We're going to be layering some alcohol on top of the smoothie. And what happens right here, right here at this juncture, is uh, you'll be getting the DNA in the in this mixture down below. The DNA comes up to the surface, it hits the alcohol, and then automatically comes out of solution. Okay? So you're going to end up with a really thin layer of watered up DNA right here. The layer, thin layer, uh, right there between the lower layer and the layer on top. Okay. Uh, it's important to understand it. The, the, the DNA is, at that point, the DNA that we're trying to collect is not down here in the lower layer. The DNA is not up here in the top layer. The DNA is, is concentrated in this two-dimensional disk right there between the alcohol on top and the strawberry extract underneath. Okay. And this is the part that's actually kind of fun. Okay. What you do is you take a, a wooden stick, right? you take a wooden, just a regular wooden stick, and just get it to the point where the tip, this tip of the stick, is right there in the DNA, in that layer in between the alcohol and the uh, smoothie underneath. And then you, you spin it. You, you twirl it like you're twirling up spaghetti on the end of a fork. You don't want to put the wooden stick all the way to the bottom. You don't want to leave it up here in the alcohol. You just want to get the tip of the stick just so it penetrates past this layer here. You twirl it up, and you'll be able to... to uh, you get this globby, slimy mass of DNA that's going to be coming out. It's really kind of gross, but you get to see what DNA looks like. The fact that it's slimy and, and filamentous is basically reminding us that there's a long, long molecule of DNA that's there. Uh, 720 million bases uh, per nucleus, per strobilary nucleus, is nothing to sneeze at. And so there's a lot of DNA there. And, uh, and this is basically just visualizing what DNA looks like.
And that part is actually pretty easy. Now we're going to be looking at another feature of, of today's laboratory. And uh, this is something you'll be setting up first towards the beginning of the laboratory, and then we'll be worrying about the other things. And this is a part of exercise 9 that's referred to as electrophoresis which is this really kind of weird enterprise in which we're going to be separating molecules of DNA based on their size. Okay? So, uh, so for example, if you were to take that, uh, all that DNA we collected from the strawberry and use restriction enzymes to chop it up into little tiny fragments, you'd end up with a whole bunch of different sized fragments that you could hypothetically want to separate out. You might want to collect one particular fragment of a particular length. And, uh, and one way of doing this, one way to, of separating things out so all the fragments of a particular length are together, is by putting them into an electrical field and letting them separate. Okay? And so uh, the way this works is it's, uh, it's, you know, we have a gel. And the, the gel is actually made of auger. It's not gelatin. It looks like gelatin. Not exactly the same stuff we used with those phenolphthalein cubes, but basically the same idea. It's a polysaccharide that is not going to melt if we apply any heat to it. And so you've got this agar, actually it's agarose gel rectangle, kind of looks like a jello wiggler. And if you look at it from the top, okay, it looks, it's a relatively thin thing. It's probably less than a centimeter thick. And we have at the ends of these little rectangular shaped wells that are in, like indentations, like little belly buttons into the well itself. Okay. If we look at it from the side, this might be the actual gel, and the wells are, they don't go all the way to the bottom, but they're little holes. We're going to put our DNA sample right here. That's going to be a mixed bag of different DNA fragments of different size, and then we're going to we'll apply a, uh, an electrical current. Now this gel is actually under the surface of an electrophoresis buffer. So yeah, the, uh, the, the tricky part of this is that you, you're going to have to put that sample in even though uh, the gel itself is already under a liquid, and the the DNA sample is going to be mixed with two things. It's going to be mixed with a glycerol, which basically makes it a little bit heavier. Uh, that allows it to sink to the bottom. So in other words, instead of having it spread out, uh, because it's underwater, it's going to be held together, and it's going to be pretty much uh, sinking pretty nicely down to the bottom of the well. And it's also going to have a loading die. It's pretty important, actually. Right, because uh, if you are trying to load a transparent substance into a gel and you can't see if that, if that substance is actually going in or if it's staying in, uh, that's a problem. So we always mix the sample DNA fragments with both glycerol to make it a little bit heavier as well as a loading die, which is going to make it uh, visible and uh, you'll know when you're messing up and you know when you're doing it right. Okay. And so the, the general idea here is we put our samples into these wells this, and the, the samples are DNA fragments of different sizes. And what happens is that if you have a fragment that's really small, uh, small fragments migrate over a, for a longer distance, and if you come back at a later time, the DNA is going to be out here. Uh, if you have a larger fragment, okay, larger fragment is going to be moving less. If you have a really large fragment, that fragment is going to be moving even less. And so if you were to have uh, a large fragment uh, and a smaller fragment, you might get, you might have something, you might ha actually have two bands that are separating out, like this. Right? Okay. If, if you were to have uh, two medium-sized bands, you might get two bands that are really close together like this, and they won't go nearly as far as the other ones. So, so uh, electrophoresis can be used to actually separate many, many bands. If you look at the uh, restriction fragment length polymorphisms that you have to use, uh, for example, with old school DNA fingerprinting, you would actually get banding patterns where you would have like these uh, several bands that are stretched out over the expanse of, of a gel. This is a pretty well understood and well used concept and, me and mechanism. And your job is going to be to use electrophoresis to get some practice loading these samples into the wells and then running the, these gels to get them to separate out. Oh yeah, the reason why they move is because DNA is an acid. And if you remember what the, the uh, charge structure of acids is, acids tend to carry negative charges, right? Because they tend to dissociate 
hydrogen ions are going to carry negative charges. So given that acids, given that nucleic acids are going to have negative charges, they're going to be wanting to move in the direction towards the positive pole. So we put the positive uh, electrode on one side, we put the negative electrode on the other side, and we create this uh, very uniform field of negative on this side, positive on this side, and because the DNA molecules are going to be attracted to the opposite charge, we'll, they'll generally move in this direction. Those that are lighter and smaller are going to travel further. Those that are heavier, larger, are going to be traveling at a shorter distance. Okay, now remember, we're going to be starting with this part of the exercise. Uh, this, is, this will be like one of the first things we do after our little test. So I'm going to give you two samples of DNA, and they're both going to contain exactly the same DNA plasmid. Now this DNA plasmid is going to contain two different restriction sites. Uh, one of these sites is going to be specific for enzyme 1. It will be cut by enzyme 1 at that site. And the other site on the same plasmid is going to be cuttable by enzyme 2. Right? Can you sort of visualize this in your mind? Okay, you've got this piece of DNA. There are uh, two sites where it can be cut. One is going to be cut by enzyme 1, the other one cut by enzyme 2. Okay, picture that in your mind. Okay. These two samples, A and B, are differing in the sense that one of them, one of these two samples, is cut only by enzyme 1. The other sample we have is going to be cut both by enzyme 1 and enzyme 2. In other words, we're going to end up with different fragment combinations depending on whether we cut the plasmid with only one enzyme or whether we cut it with both of the enzymes at the same time. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to keep you in suspense. Right? We're going to look at the gels after the electrophoresis is done, and we're going to be determining whether we have bands that are traveling farther or to a lower distance. Uh, that's the kind of information that we use to determine what kinds of fragments of DNA are there, in this case, after we cut them with the two enzymes.